It might have been Chicago scene that wanted me to get a shot of Howl and Wolf in 1961. Either they knew or I found out he was at a place, a little dump called Mr. Lee's Lounge. So I think it was on Vincennes around 79th or something like that, I believe. At any rate, at Mr. Lee's Lounge, I, I went in there and I was great, you know, for available light. Like I said, I started out uh, want, wanting to do everything available light. No fill-in light, you know, just 100% reality. So I went there without any fill-in light, and it was a dark place. It was a dark dive. The, there were no facilities. I don't remember whether I'd made arrangements out front, whether they knew I was coming, but I guess I just had my two Leicas, I think, there. But I didn't have any of the super sensitive lenses that I later got. I, I realized that I couldn't take anything with normal exposures because there just was not enough light and they didn't have a table for me, a uh, no place to set up a tripod or to use my elbows or the back of a table, uh, back of a chair for a tripod. So I just had to do what I could do, and I shot, as I recall it, over the bar at Wolf. And it seems that he was performing alone, which is rather odd for Wolf, but I don't have any indication that there was another musician. So all the shots were just of Wolf himself, and the only thing I could do was take shots with, wasn't a slow shutter, but in terms of the light, it was a slow shutter. And every time Wolf head moved or he went through his usual gyrations, what happened on the film was that there was a streak across the film. And a lot of times when his mouth was open, it looked like the teeth made a tooth mark across the film. So goofing around with it, I, I saw that some of those look really animalistic, you know, uh, very wolfish. And so I printed some of these blurry things, and they were very crazy. And somebody printed them. And Phil Chess, when he was offered the things, he said, hey, use some of his language that I don't think we can put on here. But he said, triple X, triple X, triple X, all that stuff. He said, look like damn x-rays. He said, I don't want to print anything like, like a goddamn x-ray, you know. So he turned it down and, and printed some of the less interesting stuff. But somebody, I guess it was Sing Out Magazine, I believe, printed some of the blurry stuff. And Wolf apparently had seen it. I don't think I showed it to him, but at any rate, he hated it. And when I went to interview him, first thing he said was, he said, I'm no animal, I'm a man. I said, well, you know, you use the name Howlin' Wolf. And some of your performance, you know, would make you think. He said, look, he said, if, if you had wanted to see what Wolf was really like, you'd have come to Silvio's. I said, well, okay. I mean, how about I come to Silvio's? When shall I come? But he said, come next Sunday. So in other words, I have an invitation by Wolf to go to his lair. <laughs> and it's funny, I was so shook up. Uh, by the opportunity, I went over there, and I wanted to carry a bunch of stuff, and I was so interested in doing the session. I got over there and unpacked all my stuff, and I'd forgotten to bring any film. <laughs> so, so I got him to uh, agree that I would come back the next week. So after going there without any film, <laughs> I went the next time, and he was very nice about it. And I walked in Silvio's and sat down, and Hubert Sumlin comes over to me with his nice big smile and puts a 16-ounce tumbler and fills it with 100-proof bourbon. I had made some comment about liking bourbon, and they took me seriously. <laughs> so I started this session with uh, 16 ounces of bourbon, and I was trying to be very clever about it, you know, just a little at a time, a little at a time. Then when Wolf came in, he set me up with another one. So both of them were sort of watching me out of the corner of their eye to see what was going to happen. It was a marvelous session. Wolf was very on. He had invited me. He wanted the camera there. He was not going to resent the camera this time. And he did a lot of his antics. But also there was a lot of camaraderie that a lot of people didn't realize happened with Wolf and his crowd, too. A lot of friendliness in between the guys. And you see some of the breaks, you know, and Wolf acting very gregarious and friendly and actually very pleasant to me. 
It was a very nice session. There's one mystery that I've never solved. I have a picture of Wolf going over to a table and in a very charming way, in the smoke over the table, nice picture, shaking hands with a guy who looks to me like sleepy John Estes. And I showed that to Kester, and I asked him, is that sleepy John Estes? He refused to give an opinion. I said, it looks like sleepy John to me. He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, was he in town at that time? Well, I think probably he was in town at that time. So that may be Sleepy John Estes. You know? That's interesting. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I'm, I think we should run a contest. I have that picture, is this Sleepy John Estes? And then I have another picture of Pat Hare. He's the guy who wrote that song, I'm Gonna Murder My Baby. And, and then he went out and did it. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got this picture of, I think it's Pat Hare. In 1961, it's his lead guitarist. And he has quite a sinister look on his face. And he's all blurry. Now, I'd like to run a contest. Is this sleep?